Good morning. morning. Welcome to King of Kings. This is the third Sunday after Easter, and I want you to think about what it would have been like if the risen Lord had, in fact, risen from the dead but never made an appearance to his disciples. Certainly, he would have fulfilled all of the promises connected to the resurrection, but he made it that much easier on his disciples for them to look at him and see with their eyes. That's the way we are, isn't it? So driven by what we see with our eyes and what we experience in this life. The risen Lord strengthens our faith by appearing not in humiliation, not in suffering, but in glory. And that strengthens our faith too. That's the focus of our worship today. We'll begin with the first hymn, hymn 445, He's Risen, He's Risen. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his, praise his holy name. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. The Lamb is worthy to take the scroll and open its seals.
In repentant faith, we come before the Lord to make our confession. Almighty God, we confess to you that we are sinful by nature. We have sinned against you by our selfish thoughts, our hurtful words, and our unloving actions. We have not cared for others as you would have us do. Forgive us for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. For the sake of Jesus, the Son of God, we have been set free from sin. As a called servant to the Word, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And now in the peace of that forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. O oh God, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world from the despair of death. By his resurrection to life, grant your faithful people gladness of heart and the hope of eternal joys through your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> the first lesson for this morning is recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. Saul was a persecutor of the church. In fact, he had gained the authority to go to Damascus and put Christians to death. But on the way to Damascus, the risen Savior appears to him, knocks him off his horse, and strikes him blind. He lost his physical sight. But God gave him the sight to see Jesus as the Savior of the world, and that's what God does for us through word and sacrament. He brings us out of the darkness of unbelief and opens our eyes to see Jesus as Savior. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, 
Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him and to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings, and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me to you that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. This is the word of the Lord. Psalm for this morning is Psalm 67. It's on page four of your worship folder. Second lesson, and also our sermon text, is recorded in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. The resurrected and glorified Lord alone is the one who is worthy to receive honor and glory and praise from all the hosts in heaven. He guarantees that one day we will hear their amen. 
Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Alleluia. Our hearts were burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. Alleluia. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Recorded in the gospel of John chapter 21, verses 1 through 14, Jesus appears to his disciples while they were fishing And he does a miracle that reminds them of exactly who Jesus is. Afterward, Jesus appeared to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathanael from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I am going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it, and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the gospel of our Lord. You You may be seated. The hymn of the day is hymn 449, This Joyful Easter Tide.
Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Your fellow Easter victors, It's pretty hard to ignore victory on Easter Sunday, isn't it? From the lilies and the Easter flowers that sit on the chancel to the candelabra on the pews, the empty tombstone now rolled away, the white pyramids with gold, the sign that used to be a sign of mockery hanging over the Savior's head, now changed to a message of victory. He's risen. Being able to belt out those favorite Easter hymns and then to hear your pastor say those words, Christ is risen, and for you to respond, he's risen indeed. It's hard to ignore victory on Easter, isn't it? until Monday morning. And then you turn on the news, and once again, it seems like it's nothing but bad news. Then you're sitting around in the evening, and you turn on a sitcom, and once again, Christians are the butt of all the jokes. And you get these messages from all kinds of different directions, reminders that We still, in spite of the empty tomb, in spite of the resurrection victory, we still live in a sin-broken world. And then what was so hard to ignore on Easter Sunday becomes easy to forget. It's easy to forget, isn't it, when I fall into those same familiar traps that Satan constantly puts in front of me, no matter how hard I try No matter how sincere my effort, I can't give God the glory and the honor he deserves. And then we begin to wonder, even if we believe in the resurrection, can resurrection victory really include me? When I fall into those temptations, when I give in and fail to be the kind of person that God wants me to be, should I be in the choir singing praises to the resurrected Lord? Should I be? Am I worthy to one day stand around the throne of the Lamb singing songs of praises to Him? Well, I'm pretty sure that's part of the reason why God gave John the vision recorded for us in Revelation chapter 5. And I'm pretty sure that's one of the reasons the Holy Spirit made sure that John didn't see it, just see it, but that he wrote it down and recorded the words in Scripture so that Christians for generations could meditate on those words and rejoice in those words and give thanks for the promises that come to us from them. It's easy for us Christians to forget, to forget about Easter victory. It's easy to forget that we are Easter victors too, and that's the message I want you to take home today. Don't ever forget. Don't ever forget that you are an Easter victor too. Revelation is one of those books, whenever I'm asking the Bible class for suggestions of what to teach next, a lot of people want to study the book of Revelation. And I think part of the reason for that is the fantastic, wild images, beautiful, picturesque language God uses in the book. And we find exactly one of those in John chapter, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 5, John sees a jewel-adorned throne. A jewel-adorned throne surrounded and encircled by a rainbow that looks like an emerald. 
And then around that throne, there are 24 other thrones with white-robed, gold-crown-wearing occupants. And in front of that, there are seven golden lampstands on what looks to be a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Well, around the throne, there were also four living creatures. They all looked different. One of them looked like a lion. One looked like an ox. One of them had the face of a human being. One looked like a flying eagle. And they all had six wings, covered with eyes, eyes even under the wings. And they could not, they would not stop singing praises to God. Well, we don't have time to go into what all that imagery means, but I do want to direct your attention to one picture that John gives us at the beginning of chapter 5. John looks at this throne, and he sees that the one sitting on the throne was holding a scroll. That's God. And the scroll had seven seals, and no one in heaven and on earth and under the earth were able and worthy to open that scroll except, except the lamb who was slain. We have a picture in our mind, don't we, when it comes to that idea of the lamb that was slain. But here in Revelation 5, he's pictured differently. The slain lamb had seven horns, a picture of power and strength. And he had seven eyes as well, picture of wisdom. And it was because of that power and wisdom that even though the lamb was slain, that he was worthy to open the scrolls. And when he did, the four living creatures, the 24 elders that surrounded the throne and 10,000 times 10,000 angels erupted in a song of praise to God. And then they switched the focus of their song. They switched the focus to the Lamb. Listen to the words they sang. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Well, after that description and all that imagery, you might not ever want to study the book of Revelation again. It seems so far out there and so weird, but maybe I can clear up a little bit of the confusion about what that all means, putting it in terms that maybe are a little bit more familiar to you. On Ascension Day, from the disciples' perspective, they saw the risen Lord rising up into the clouds, and he disappeared from their sight. Well, that scene that I just described in Revelation is really Ascension Day from a heavenly perspective. Jesus, the Son of God, enthroned in glory, left that throne and came down to this world in humility. And he came down here to suffer suffer to pay for our sins, die to get rid of our guilt. He, in fact, was under the law for us, accumulating holiness and righteousness to be given to us by faith. He hung on the cross we deserve because of our sins. And there he poured out his blood and purified us from all of our unrighteousness. Jesus God from eternity, enthroned in heaven, came down here to step into your grave. But he didn't stay there. He didn't remain in suffering. He didn't continue in humility. But in fact, he rose from the dead, accomplished the work of salvation and redemption, and now he's returning, returning to heaven in glory that was always his, but hidden for a time while he was here on this earth. But now that the work of salvation was done, he's coming home to heaven to receive the honor and glory he's due. 
That's the picture God gives John in Revelation chapter 5, but the question is why? Well, God didn't just give this vision to be seen by John. God gave him this vision so that he would record it, so that he would write it down and be able to send it to Christians still living in this world, Christians who were frustrated and filled with anxiety and worry, Christians that were, in fact, being persecuted, Christians living in a world that makes it so easy to forget the victory of the resurrection. Christians prone to forget that they're Easter victors too. We live in a world just like that, don't we? A world of frustration because so often it seems like the things we try here at church to build the ministry so often seem to fall flat on their face. A world where in your life financial worries fill you with frustration Health concerns make you well up with anxiety. A world in which we so easily forget the Easter victory because we're so wrapped up with what we can see with our eyes and it doesn't scream victory. A world where we get so wound up by our own emotions, the suffering and the pain of living in a world still broken by sin. We forget, don't we? We forget to look to that cross and know that every single one of our offenses is washed away in the blood of Jesus. We forget to look to the empty tomb and know that no matter what we're experiencing, all of this ends in life that lasts forever. We forget. We forget, don't we, that as we go through life and we experience life's troubles, life's pains, life's worries, that Jesus knows every single one of them. And more than that, he knows about them. He cares about us. And he's working to make all of them work out for our good. We're so prone to forget that the Holy Spirit came to us and he opened our eyes of faith and he made us saints before God in status. And we so easily forget that that Holy Spirit continues to work in our hearts to make sure that our actions match our status and that every day we live a little bit more like Christ. Do you ever worry that all of that might be true, but maybe not true for you? Do you belong? Do you belong in the choir of angels? Do you belong one day rejoicing around the throne of the Lamb? Well, I want you to listen to the second part of John's vision. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. It wasn't just the angels. It wasn't just the 24 elders, the four living creatures singing praise to God. It was every single soul redeemed by the blood of Christ, and that means you. you know, the simple fact is, you're not worthy to be there. Neither am I. But as they were singing the song, they weren't singing, worthy are some people to be there because they're so good. No, they were singing, worthy is the lamb who was slain. And through that death, he made you worthy in status. You're not worthy. Neither am I. But Jesus is worthy enough for us both. Do not be fooled by what you see with your eyes. Do not be ruled by your emotions and what you feel in the pit of your stomach. 
We still live in a, in a world where Satan pretends like he is victorious. We still live in a world that seeks to press us down and push us down and stay on top of us. But don't ever forget that you are Easter victors too. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Please stand. Join me in confessing your Christian faith. We'll use the words of the Nicene Creed on pages 6 and 7 of your worship folder. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We pray. Almighty God, as Jesus absolved Peter, converted Paul, and sent them to feed your sheep and your lambs, so preserve pastors from doubt and Satan's attacks that would prevent them from claiming the victory of Christ's death and resurrection. Cause unbelievers everywhere to have their eyes open through faith to see your Son in the means of grace. And bring them to rejoice that you have made us the people of your pasture and the sheep of your hand. By your word and sacraments, preserve us when we're tempted by sins that would deceive us or lead us into despair or soul-destroying impenitence. Move us to repentance and grant that we might live joyful lives as those forgiven who look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Your risen Son provided for the physical needs of the disciples by giving them bread and fish, even as he cared for their souls. On every day and at every meal, grant us thankful hearts that recognize that you still provide for all of our wants of our body and soul and move us to share what we have with those in need. Remember your people who find themselves alone and lonely. Strengthen them in the confidence that you have not forgotten them or forsaken them, Grant that we might be messengers of your grace and faithfulness and assure them that you will deliver them to your eternal kingdom. Receive our thanks for your faithfulness to all who have died in the faith. Be with us when we mourn for them and preserve us in the hope that day, of that day when you will turn our mourning into joy forever. We pray this through Jesus Christ, your Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms and placed all things under his feet for the benefit of the church. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Hosanna in the highest. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
We thank you, O holy God, for delivering us from sin and giving us life and salvation through this holy meal. Freed from the burden of our guilt, may we glorify you in love toward one another and in service toward our neighbor, that Christ's light may shine in the darkness of this world and by your Spirit's aid cause us to pay attention to your truth through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated for our closing hymn, hymn 711. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult. Good morning. Welcome once again to all of you. Just a note, please take a moment, sign the friendship register before you leave that red folder in your pew so that we may get to know you just a little bit better. There are a couple of uh, mistakes in the bulletin on uh, the things for the week, things going on this week. There will be no catechism class tomorrow night, and there will also be no weathering the storm meeting. I have to go down to Tucson for pastor's conference. Um, one announcement that I'd like to highlight on Saturday of this week, there is a Lydia Project um, event going on. Stephanie, will you just tell us what's going on and when to be here? <laughs> she wasn't anticipating me doing that. <laughs> One o'clock Saturday over in the Education Center. And the thought behind that is it, it, if you're handing something to someone, it gives you an opportunity to talk to them. Uh, they'll probably ask you, why are you doing that? And you have the opportunity to tell them, 
I am so thankful that my Savior died for me and rose again. I want to share a little bit of that happiness with you. Something like that. But it gives you an opportunity to, to start some discussions. So that's next week, 1 o'clock, over in the Education Center. Anyone else have announcements they'd like to make? Special welcome to guests and visitors. Come back and join us again. We're, we loved having you here.